Okay, guys, we're going to do some notes on element fingerprints, which might sound really weird, but we're going to get to the meaning of the title at the end of the notes. I'm going to try to use a better marker this time so it's a little bit clearer. But element fingerprints is our title. Element fingerprints, okay? Okay, so first we're gonna do a little review of atomic structure. A little review of atomic structure. And so that's what atoms are made of. Okay, so hopefully in your mind, maybe you remember the three pieces of an atom that we've been talking about, and that is uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, so we're going to make a little table here with protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons, neutrons, electrons. And we're going to write several things about them. Okay, first off, their symbol. Symbol. Symbol of a proton is P plus. So lowercase p with a plus sign in the upper right hand corner, kind of like an exponent. Okay. Neutrons are N zero and electrons are E negative. And remember that these are the charges that those particles have. So protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, electrons are negative. Okay. All right, next thing. Location. Location. Where are they located in the atom? And so protons and neutrons are both in the nucleus. So they're packed in the center part of the atom, in this tiny, tiny nucleus. And electrons are in layers around the nucleus. They're in layers around the nucleus. Okay, then the last column here is going to be number in the atom. In other words, how do we determine the number of protons in the atom, the number of neutrons, the number of electrons? Okay, so protons is the atomic number. Okay, always the atomic number tells you the number of protons in an atom. Neutrons are the mass number minus the atomic number. And remember, we can't have half of a neutron or part of a neutron, so you always have to round your mass in the periodic table to a whole number and then subtract the atomic number. And finally, electrons. Electrons are also the atomic number. Okay, so first, once we've figured all this stuff out, now we can use these tools to help us draw an illustration of an atom. Now remember, models of atoms that we draw on paper don't actually look like what an atom looks like. And we'll talk about that more as we draw one. But we're gonna do an example illustration. We're gonna do two example illustrations, okay? Remember in notes from before that we talked about the electron layers, okay? And I'm gonna just put a little note to ourselves: Number of layers of electrons in the atom is equal to the row number in the periodic table. Okay, equals the row number of the periodic table. So there's only seven rows in the periodic table, so the biggest atoms that we have have seven layers of electrons around their nucleus. Okay, okay so we're going to start by drawing an example of sodium. And the symbol for sodium is Na. So we find that on the periodic table, and we're going to see that it has atomic number 11. Okay, so it has 11 protons because it has an atomic number 11. Okay. It also has a mass number of 23. 
Well, neutrons are mass minus atomic number. So 23 minus 11, and we get 12 neutrons. Okay, and then the electrons are also the atomic number. So we have 11 protons, 11 electrons. Those positives and negatives balance each other, okay? All right, then the final piece of information is number of layers. If you look at sodium on the periodic table, it's in the third row. It's so right at the beginning of the third row of the periodic table. So there are three layers of electrons, three layers of electrons in sodium. Okay, so what I'm gonna do first is I'm going to draw my three layers kind of like rings, okay? Now this is where the atom really doesn't look like this. There's not rings of electrons around a nucleus, but I'm gonna draw them that way because we're just trying to show a model, okay? The model is gonna show the layers, but we have to remember in our minds that the layers are a lot more complicated than just a ring. It's not a solar system. It's a three-dimensional spherical atom, and those electrons are whizzing around all kinds of crazy in these layers. Okay, so think of it more like an onion, but even that isn't going to do it justice, okay? Now remember, the nucleus is in the center, and that has the protons and the neutrons, so we have to put those in there. Instead of drawing them, I just want to write them in there to just save myself a little bit of space, okay? So I'm just going to write 11 P plus, 11 protons, and I'm going to write 12 N0, 12 neutrons in the middle. So again, if you can't read that, that's 11 protons, 12 neutrons. I just wrote them in the middle to show that I know that they are there in the nucleus. Now I have to go through and I have to add 11 electrons to my atom in these three layers. And there's a very specific way to do that. We have to use our periodic table. Now remember, each layer is represented by a row in the periodic table. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try and show you the periodic table here. If we look at the first row in the periodic table, first row, top row, way up here, okay? How many elements are in that row? Two, hydrogen and helium, okay? So those two elements represent the first two electrons in an atom. They're gonna be in the first layer of the atom. So I'm just gonna put some dots on that first layer, two of them to represent those first two electrons, okay? but I'm going all the way till I get to 11, so I have to keep going. So now I'm gonna look at layer two. Layer two is row two in the periodic table, and I'm gonna count how many elements there are. So if you count, starting at lithium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, you're gonna get eight atoms, eight elements in row two. Eight elements in row two also represents eight different electrons in the second layer of the atom. So in the second layer, I'm going to add eight dots. So there's four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, again, the number of elements in that row is the maximum number of electrons in that layer of the atom. Okay, so two electrons only in the first layer because there's only two elements in the first row of the periodic table. Okay, eight elements in the second row means you can have eight electrons in the second layer. Okay, but when you get to your final layer, layer three for sodium, you have to pay attention to where sodium is. So again, if we look at layer three, row three here, sodium is right here. It's the first element in row three, the first one. So because it's the first one, there's only one electron in the third layer for sodium. Okay, so right here, that is our final electron. And a way to double check is you go back and you count. There's two here plus eight in the second layer, that's 10, and that one makes 11. We can't have more than 11 in sodium. 11 is the number of electrons that sodium has, okay? So once you get to your final layer, you have to figure out how far in is that element so that you can get the right number in that outermost layer. So let's do it again. If you wanna try it on your own this time, you can. You can pause the video and try it. I'm just gonna go straight through, but we're gonna do it with chlorine. Chlorine is Cl. If we look at the periodic table, chlorine is number 17 on the periodic table. So it has 17 protons. 
okay? And it is 35.5 for the mass. So remember, round the mass up, so that's 36. Subtract 17, totally use a calculator if you wanna do that. And we're gonna get 19 neutrons, 19 neutrons, okay? And because electrons and protons have to balance, we have 17 electrons, okay? Atomic number, atomic number, mass number minus atomic number. Also, if we look at where chlorine is right here, it's in the same row as sodium, which means it has three layers of electrons, okay? So we're also gonna have three layers. Okay, now we're gonna draw our first, our first step, draw our three layers here to give us a place to put everything. Okay, so there's my three layers. Now I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna add electrons. Remember row one has two elements, so layer one has two electrons. Oh, I forgot my nucleus. Protons and neutrons go in the nucleus, so I'm gonna write 17 P plus, 19 and zero in the middle. So remember, I know that that's really tiny on your screen, but whatever the protons and neutrons are, both of those have to get written in the middle to show that we know that they are there in the nucleus. Okay, back to my electrons. I put my first two for my first row, which is my first layer. Second row of the periodic table has eight elements, which means the second layer of my atom has eight electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Make sure when you're drawing that you make them obvious because I'm gonna be counting those when we get to a test and if you just have random dots, you're gonna be missing out on those points. Okay, now we're in the third layer. Pause a second. Whenever you are in the outermost layer, you need to count to your element, okay? Don't just fill it up. There's eight elements in the third row of the periodic table, but I did not put eight dots over here on the third layer because sodium was the first element in row three. Now we need to look at chlorine. Chlorine is the seventh element in row three. It's right here. And if you count it across from sodium, magnesium, all the way to chlorine, you're going to get seven. So there are only seven electrons in the outermost layer for chlorine. I'm going to put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that is the drawing, our model for chlorine. Okay, okay now we're going to talk about energy in atoms. Energy in atoms. Now, this is still part of element fingerprint notes. I'm gonna, again, when we get to the end of these notes, we're going to understand what the heck we mean by element fingerprints, okay? So energy in atoms. This is the next major topic that we're going to do here. But low energy. We're going to talk about low energy first. Okay, low energy. All right. Write this out with me. Listen and write at the same time if you can, all right? When atoms are stable, when atoms are stable, when atoms are stable, comma, their electrons are in their normal layers. Their electrons are in their normal layers. Their electrons are in their normal layers around the nucleus. In the normal layers around the nucleus. And there's a name for this. When electrons are in their normal layers around the nucleus, we call that the ground state. So I'm just going to put equals ground state. Ground state. So you might want to highlight that or underline it, star it, whatever you need to do to make that kind of pop out at you, okay? Ground state. So the way that we drew these two atoms over here, this is where those electrons would be when they are at low energy, just chilling out at ground state, okay? Now we're going to talk about higher energy.
higher energy. Not highest, higher. There's a difference, okay? Anything above the ground state is gonna be higher. Highest is not really a thing, okay? Because you can always put more energy into something. It's gonna change it, but you're gonna put more energy into it. Okay, here we go. When atoms, when atoms gain energy, when atoms gain energy from being heated or shocked, when atoms gain energy from being heated or shocked, we're gonna do two lab activities coming up here. One where we stick elements into different flames and see what happens to their electrons by observing the reaction. And one where we zap them with electricity. So you can use heat or shock electricity to add energy into things, okay? So back over here, when atoms gain energy from being heated or shocked, their electrons jump. Their electrons jump. I'm going to put quotation marks around jump because electrons don't have legs, so they can't actually jump the way that we jump, okay? But their electrons jump to higher layers. To higher layers. Higher layers. So, for example, maybe one of these electrons in the second layer jumps up to the third layer for sodium. Okay? If it gains enough energy, it can make that jump. And this is called excited states. Excited states. Higher layers are not stable. Higher layers are not stable. So the electrons fall back to the lower energy layers. Higher layers are not stable. So the electrons fall back fall back to the lower energy layers. Higher layers are not stable, so the electrons fall back to the lower energy layers. When they fall back, When they fall back, they release the extra energy in the form of light. When they fall back, they release the extra energy in the form of light. Now we're gonna draw a little graph that represents this. So I'm just gonna erase this side. And we're gonna do a graph and the, the y-axis is gonna be energy. Energy, okay. And that x-axis, the horizontal line here, is gonna be the lowest possible energy, okay? Now every atom is gonna have a different low energy state, but 
what do we call that low energy state, okay? When they're in their low energy, when they're stable, that's the ground state. So right here, this line that I just drew, we're gonna call that the ground state. Ground state, okay? Now, if I have an electron in the ground state, I'm gonna draw a little dot there, okay? And I zap it with electricity or with a flame, high temperature, okay? It's gonna jump up to a higher level of energy. So I'm just gonna add a line or two up here to represent higher levels of energy. So this electron can jump, maybe it just jumps that far, just jumps up like that, okay? Now it's not stable there. Low energy is stability. If you give a, a three-year-old a bag full of candy and they eat it all, they're not gonna be stable because they're gonna be on a sugar rush, okay? When they crash later and they're taking a nap, they're in a low energy state. That's the stable state, okay? Same thing with electrons. Low energy is stable. So that electron is gonna come back down to that low energy state, okay? It's gonna come right back down to low energy. And when it does that, it has to give away the energy that just came into it, and that is gonna come off in the form of light. And so we do a little arrow, a little squiggly arrow, to represent light, okay? It could jump two layers, if it, if it gets enough energy, okay? And if it jumps two layers, it could go straight back down, all the way back to ground, or it could fall down to the next layer and then fall down to ground. So we could do something like this, and this one gives off a little bit of light, and then it falls back down to this one, and it gives off light again, okay? So let's make ourselves a little bit of a key here. First of all, these two lines up here, this is an excited state. And this is an excited state. So ground state is just the bottom. All the states above that are excited states, okay? And upward arrow equals absorbing, the electron is absorbing energy. Okay, so an upward arrow is an electron absorbing energy. And remember that can be heat, or electricity giving it that energy boost, okay? A downward arrow is the electron return, returning to ground. Electron returning to ground state, okay? And the squiggly arrows are light being released. light being released, okay? And that is what we see. So if we shock electricity through an element, then those electrons inside those atoms are gonna jump up and then fall right back down and give off light. And that's actually how the lights in our classroom work. We're running electricity through a tube of gas. The electrons in the gas are going haywire, jumping up, falling down, jumping up, falling down, so super fast. And when they fall down, they give off light, and all the different types of light that they give off combine to make this white fluorescent light that we have in our classrooms, okay? And so let's talk about types of light because these different drops aren't all gonna give the same amount of energy, okay? Well, these two are because they're the same distance, but this little one, this big one, those aren't gonna give the same amount of energy. If I had an electron jump straight up to level two and then fall all the way back down to ground, it gives off even more energy, which is a different kind of light. So we're gonna talk about types of light, and that's our next topic. Types of light energy. Types of light energy. And this is also called the electromagnetic spectrum. electromagnetic spectrum. So light is all electromagnetic waves. So we call it the electromagnetic spectrum. And there are lots of different types of light. We're gonna start with something that you probably don't think of as light, and that's radio waves. 
radio waves are a type of light and they're flying through us and through the room all the time. They're flying through our air to get to our radio receivers, okay? So radio waves. Next in this list is microwaves. Microwaves. Microwaves, microwave oven, microwaves are used for cell phone communication. Your cell phone sends microwaves to a cell phone tower and the cell phone tower sends microwaves back. But a microwave oven concentrates those waves, uses them to jiggle the water molecules and make your food warmer. So microwaves are a type of light. Okay. Uh, infrared. Infrared, which we could just do IR as an abbreviation, but that is a type of light as well. It's kind of heat radiation is what we normally think of it as. You might have heard of infrared glasses that kind of help people see um, warm bodies at night, okay? Then we have visible light in the middle. This tiny little piece of the spectrum is what we can see, okay? Outside of visible light on this side, we have ultraviolet ultraviolet, which UV, you might recognize that one as part of the dangerous radiation that comes from the sun. Beyond ultraviolet, we have x-rays. And beyond x-rays, we have gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is a dangerous nuclear radiation comes from radioactive materials and it can cause cancer. X-rays can cause problems too. That's why we wear a lead vest over everything that we're not wanting the X-rays in. X-rays are very high energy and can be harmful. All right, back to the visible light for just a second. Visible light is a rainbow. We have a full spectrum of colors that we can see and they go in order by energy. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, Indigo, violet, Roy G. Biv. I'm not sure if you've ever heard that before, but Roy G. Biv. That's all the colors of light that we can see. Indigo is kind of a, can't tell if it's blue or purple, so it's going to be in between them. So indigo, okay, kind of a dark bluish purple color, okay? All right, in this spectrum, they are in this order for a specific reason. Over here, we have the lowest energy. lowest energy form of light, and gamma radiation is the highest energy. Okay. On that side, we have the longest wavelength. And because light travels in waves, okay. On this side, we have the shortest wave. Over here, we have the lowest frequency. So when you have long waves, you don't see them as often, so the low frequency. And over here, we have our highest frequency. Highest frequency. So when they're, they're short, you're gonna see them a lot more often, okay? All of them travel at the speed of light all travel at the speed of light. Or you could say light speed. All of them travel the same speed, whether it's a radio wave or gamma radiation. They all travel super, super fast, okay? Okay, we have just enough time to do the last piece, which is element fingerprints, which is the title of these notes. Now that we've learned about the types of light, we can talk about element fingerprints. Okay, all right, here we go. Electrons, electrons in different elements jump and fall different distances. Electrons in different elements jump and fall 
different distances. This releases different types of light. This releases different types of light. So the more energy that is released, the closer to this end of the spectrum we are, and the less energy is released, the closer to this end. So if we're looking just at these two jumps right here, this one might be red light. Red has less energy than orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. This one might be green light because it has more energy than red. So it could be these two, or it could be these two, or it could be these two, these two. But the smaller the jump, the smaller the fall, the less energy is being given off. So it's going to be closer to that end of the spectrum. Okay? So we see these patterns of light. We see these patterns of light. We see these patterns of light using a prism, prism splits the light into the rainbow, or diffraction glasses, or diffraction glasses. The light patterns are unique fingerprints. The light patterns are unique fingerprints. For each element. The light patterns are unique fingerprints for each element. So when we come back to class, we will be doing a lab where we analyze the light from different elements, and then we can use that, the patterns that they make, to identify an unknown element. When we see it, we can match its pattern to what we've already seen and figure out what element it is. So something to look forward to, but this is why the notes were called element fingerprints. So we will see you guys when you come to class.